Hello, hello, and welcome back, everyone. Today we are talking about something near and dear to my heart. It's the top 10 indigenous heroes that changed history. I've made sure to blend some recent and past examples in history, as there are many to choose from, and all are heroes who contributed to change in different ways. Let's start at number 10 with Richard Wagamese. If you've gone through public high school education in Ontario, there's a chance that this name may ring a bell. This is because Richard Wagamese's books have started to be incorporated into English education in some school boards. Richard Wagamese started as a journalist in 1979 for the indigenous newspaper The New Breed. And later in 1991, his writings in the popular Calgary Herald, alongside television and radio broadcasting, earned him the title of the first indigenous writer to win a national magazine award for column writing. His 1994 debut novel, Keeper and me earned him the Alberta Writers Guild Best Novel Award. Wagamese went on to write eight novels, a poetry collection, and multiple anthologies. His book Indian Horse, now read in schools around Canada, won a People's Choice Award and had a movie made. Wagamese used this platform to not only break out and make history as an Indigenous writer, but also to document his own experiences with the intergenerational trauma and being a victim of the 60s scoop. While his impact may not be considered as grand as others on this list, without Wagamese, many Indigenous poets and writers wouldn't have been able to follow into the footsteps that they have now. For many Canadians, Richard Wagamese introduced Indigenous literature to their lives. Richard sadly passed in 2017, so I'll leave you with the beautiful words he had responded when once asked about his passion. All that we are is a story. From the moment we are born to the time we continue on our spirit journey, we are involved in the creation of a story of our time here. It is what we arrive with, it is all we leave behind. We are not the things we accumulate, we are not the things we deem important, we are story. Thelma Chalifaux is number 9 in our countdown and she is actually the first ever Indigenous woman and first Métis person to be appointed to Canadian Senate. Chalifaux fought tooth and nail to earn this title as well. Born in 1929, Calgary, she married and was a mother at a very young age. Unfortunately, like how Richard was taken from his parents, Chalifaux had her four children stolen from her during the 60s scoop in 1958. Working two jobs while in high school, she fought for the return of her children, which was achieved in 1965. So if you think she's hard working, you're right. And so did the staff at the Edmonton office for Métis Associations, where she was offered a job on the spot when she visited visited to get her membership updated. Her confidence, charisma, and, and drive was evident to them, and she got roles as a field worker, responsible for the association's welfare and land departments. Using her work platform, she co-founds the Native Friendship Center and the first shelter for women fleeing domestic violence in Slave Lake, Alberta. She served in the company of young Canadians working on Indigenous housing and community development, and she also hosted a weekly radio show. In the 1980s, Chalifo was still making waves. She was part of the Métis delegation in constitutional talks with Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, working for the recognition of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people as separate and distinct nations. In 1997, she was appointed to Senate, and after her retirement in 2004, Chalifaux founded the Michif Cultural Institute, a museum and resource center dedicated to preserving and promoting Métis culture. A little less recent is Tom Longboat in at number 8. Longboat is a renowned Canadian athlete in history and considered one of the first ever celebrity athletes of Canada. A huge honor. Let's start with how Tom was Onondaga from Six Nations of the Grand River here in Ontario. He was rumored to have run 65 kilometers from Hamilton to Brantford, Ontario, arriving home before his mother, who had left hours earlier in a wagon before he was even 15 years old. Longboat was unfortunately forced to attendee of the Mohawk Institute Residential School in Brantford, where he ran away twice. Tom became a leader in establishing the marathon as an international sport and won dozens in record-breaking times and beating the global competition. He became the first Indigenous person to win the Boston Marathon in 1907 and he competed for Canada in the 1908 Olympics. Tom has been inducted into the Canada Sports Hall of Fame as well as Ontario Sports Hall of Fame. Longboat went on to win Toronto's Ward Marathon for a third time in 1908 as well as the World's Professional Marathon Championship in 1909. What also made history was Tom's use of hard, easy recovery days for his training. He was called lazy and smeared by the press and managers alike in the time. In response, Tom bought out his runner's contract and continued his preferred training method and was even faster by his next race. This method Tom used is actually the one now used by runners globally and taught in physical education. Tom Longboat eventually abandoned his lucrative running career to enlist as a dispatch carrier and ran messages and orders between units in World War I. After the war, he lived a comfortable life in Toronto and then later died in his homeland of Six Nations. Number 7, we meet Dr. Stanley Boland. Working in the field of medicine, Stanley uses his own pain to aid other Indigenous peoples whilst making history in Canada's medical field. Born in 1965, Stanley comes from a village in North Shore, Quebec. He's spoke his people's language, Inu, and was raised by grandparents who taught him love and cultivation of land. In school, Stanley learned French and excelled in his education. For post-secondary, he chose the Université de Montréal and finished his residency in general surgery in 1994. Stanley
Stanley became the first Innu surgeon in Quebec, where he became known for his innovative work, particularly in laparoscopy surgery, and lectured in many schools. In 2001, Stanley was elected the president of Quebec's Medical Association, the first indigenous person to head a medical association in North America. After moving to Ottawa, he served as a director for Aboriginal program at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Medicine until a deep depressive episode. And on 2008, on a walking escapade in Spain, that he had a visitation from his grandfather's spirit encouraging him to start a similar walk in Canada to help connect indigenous communities and inspire indigenous youth. Stanley started to change lives in other ways than medicine. In 2010, he began his 6,000 kilometer Innu Meshkanu, translated to My Innu Path, from Labrador through Quebec and Ontario. He began speaking at schools and bringing elders and youth together along the way. Number six is Double Trouble. Meet Josephine Madadim and Autumn Peltier. Why two for two? Because Josephine and Autumn may be different generations, but these ladies are actually related and share the same goal. Clean, non-polluted drinking water. The fact that indigenous peoples of today are still battling to be provided the basic right of accessible and clean drinking water is absurd. The fact that we have two separate generations of women from the same family fighting for this cause goes to show its duration, but also the resilience and the refusal to give up. Josephine was born in 1942 on unceded territory in Ontario, Canada. Josephine was a victim of Canada's residential schools and it launched her drive to help indigenous youths after moving to Thunder Bay, where she worked at a residence for students from First Nations and also a group home for First Nation youths with mental illnesses. Following a prophecy by a chief, Josephine organized indigenous groups in protest of water pollution and wastage. From 2003 to 2017, Josephine organized and led a series of water walks around the Great Lakes and surrounding waters. During her final water walk in 2017, Josephine trekked from Spirit Mountain in Duluth, Minnesota to Montaigne, Quebec, a distance measuring more than 8,000 kilometers. Josephine became the world's renowned water activist and led the Earth Mother Water Walkers, earning the title Grandmother Water Walker. For her activism, Josephine was awarded the Anishabek Lifetime Achievement Award and the Governor General's Meritocious Service Cross. Her great niece, Autumn Peltier, followed in Josephine's footsteps, becoming the next generation's water warrior after her aunt's passing. Autumn was only 15 when she first spoke to the UN General Assembly on the issue of water protection in 2018. The bias I have with this one is just, whoo. Number five is the legendary auntie Buffy St. Marie. You know it's time to get up and start cleaning when you hear her playing on your house in a Sunday morning. Born Beverly St. Marie, Buffy is a renowned singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist creative who's known for her social activism and philanthropy. She started making music way back in the 60s, and she was an important figure in the Greenwich Village and Toronto folk music revivals. That's right, a real hippie making real hippie music. Her 1964 anti-war anthem, Universal Soldier, was inducted in the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2005. Her songs have been covered by such artists as Barbara Streisand, Neil Diamond, Elvis Presley, and Glenn Campbell. She actually even won a Golden Globe and an Academy Award in 1983 for writing the hit song, Up Where We Belong. Bet you didn't know that was by her. Buffy has invested her own money into her philanthropy, and it's an extensive list. Since 1968, she's operated the Neil Hwan Foundation for Native American Education, and in 1980, she was asked by her son's school teacher to deliver teaching units about indigenous peoples, inspiring Buffy to develop an entirely new way of teaching core school subjects with the help and support of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Herb Alpert Foundation, and the Global Fund for Children. Her team created the Cradle Board Teaching Project in the 1990s, delivering their own accurate enriching teaching materials to their non-indigenous partner classes across the continent and teachers worldwide for 15 years, free, live, and online, connecting indigenous and non-indigenous classes through the new core curriculum. Buffy has never taken a salary and has always kept the foundation's operation costs under 15%. Buffy also worked in Hollywood to ensure that for the first time ever, indigenous acting roles be filled by indigenous actors as a condition for her to appear in their movies and televisions. These are important efforts that have not gone unnoticed. The American Indian College Fund presented Buffy with the Lifetime Achievement Award. She was named the Native American Th Philanthropist of the Year and received the Louis J. Delegato Award for her work in giving. She presently serves on the board of the Downey Wenjack Fund and their Education Committee. If you want to venture into her music, I personally recommend my favorite song, Starwalker. Annie Van Tain is straight deadly and number four, formidable and determined is how Annie's remembered and deservedly so. She was born in the Red River Settlement in 1832 to an Irish father and a Métis woman and was one of nine daughters in a family of 17. Whew. Annie grew up rugged and tough and that determination remained after marrying prominent businessman AGP Bonatine. She pursued education and became a leading force in early philanthropy of Red River by founding a ladies association. An association responsible for the Winnipeg General Hospital through charity alongside her father and husband donating the land for its cause. The ladies association evolved into the Women's Hospital Aid Society which helped raise money 
money and donations for goods many years to come. But what she's mostly remembered for, however, was her whipping of Charles Mayer, an anti Metis, anti Indigenous writer for the Toronto Globe. He had consistently smeared women in the column, and when he went after Annie by name, uh, she didn't tolerate it. The story goes that Annie ordered a clerk from her husband's store to go by the local post office and come fetch her whenever Mayer decided to collect his papers that Saturday. So that Saturday at 4 p.m., the clerk rushed to fetch Annie, who is now recounted to have burst into the post office full of people. She didn't hesitate, grabbing Mayer by the nose, and she whipped him publicly, stating loudly for all to hear, look, this is how the women of Red River treat those who insult them. While this event lasted mere minutes, by the evening the whole countryside knew, including Louis Riel, who we'll get back to in one second. Number three, we meet the face of TNR, Senator Murray Sinclair. This is not an easy job to have, and even the topic of it is devastating for those of us affected by intergenerational trauma caused by residential schools. Murray Sinclair served as the co-chair of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry in Manitoba and as a chief commissioner for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In 1994, Murray Sinclair was a two-time recipient of the National Aboriginal Achievement Award, now INSPIRE, in the category of Law and Justice for his work as the first Aboriginal Associate Chief Justice in Manitoba. Serving for 25 years in the Manitoba justice system, he first broke the ice of Indigenous knowledge sharing in 1981 as an adjunct professor of law at the UOM. In 1988, he served under titles such as co-commissioner of the public inquiry, into the administration, and of justice of Aboriginal peoples of Manitoba. He's made history already with these achievements, but he changed it when in 2009, Sinclair became the appointed chair of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He became instrumental in making space for over 6,000 survivors of residential schools so that finally they could share their story on a national level. This was a devastating process for the victims, many of which had never spoke out about what they incurred. Sinclair dedicated time and resources to the proper documentation of these stories so that Canadians may finally properly learn the degree of depravity that occurred in this piece of Canadian history. These stories allowed for an opportunity of collective forgiveness and healing. Victims were allocated funds to try and repair some of the damage, but unfortunately a dollar bill does not undo violation of this degree. Okay, so it's been a second, oh well maybe more than one, but Louis Riel is number two. If you're raised in Canada, there's a better chance that you know this name. It's grade six history for me. He's considered the founding father of Manitoba and the revered leader of the Métis people. Riel is remembered for his valiant fight to preserve the land, culture, and rights of Métis people under the aggressive influence and invasion of colonial Europe across the country. In March 1869, the HBC agreed to sell the Rupert's land and the Northwest Territory to the Dominion of Canada. Panic Métis, predicting an influx of colonizers, settlers, branded the Métis National Committee in order to protect social, cultural, and political status of Métis in Red River. Riel was made the president for his articulation. 11th of October, 1869, Riel's committee halted the Canadian land surveyors. A month goes by and on November 2nd, a roadblock prevented governmental entrance to Red River settlement. The same day, their committee seized the Upper Fort Gary from the HBC and with little resistance from HBC officials, they took steps to establish itself under Riel's leadership as the government of Red River settlement. They drew up a provisional government which contained three branches of governing, an elected legislation, an executive responsibility to the legislation, and a fledging judicial branch. Canadian government chose not to consider Riel's equitable laws and land separation propositions. They tried to send in armed forces and they're quickly taken by Riel's committee. Riel's decision to execute some of the officials infuriates the Protestants and the government, leading to his future defamation, but ultimately results in the Manitoba Act. The federal government agreed to reserve 1.4 million acres for the children of Métis residents of Manitoba and ensured that the province would be officially bilingual. Real story, decisions, and accomplishments for Indigenous Canadians are incredibly extensive and could probably have a countdown video of its own. Number one has no debate. It's Hiawatha. Without Hiawatha, all of North America would be drastically different. If you watched our top 10 Indigenous inventions video, you may know that North American democracy was based off the Six Nations, which was an existing democracy in Canada long before the colonizers ever set foot on this land. The story of Hiawatha and the joining of the Six Nations is arguably a blend between historical legend and the truth. His true clan origin, the year of the Confederacy was formed, the debate of on if Hiawatha was his real name, it all still remains up in the air. The tale varies from elder to elder and family to family. However, one consistent aspect of both of these tales is the story of Hiawatha is born when blood feuds between clans known as the Mourning Wars occurred between varying groups waging war on one another in a never ending cycle of violence. Famine plagued the colonies as war emptied food stores and the hunters were away during the pivotal hunting seasons pre winter. The ego and honor of warfare were poison to the land, a land Hiawatha emerges from. He is one of three figures, each representing an aspect of violence that plagued their peoples. Hiawatha represented the inconsolable victim of bloodshed, forever mourning and depressed and following the loss of his family. The second figure, Atataro, was said to have snakes for hair and dark magic. He was an aggressor, the representative. 
representation of oppression, robbing ancient rights of counsel and discussion. Deganawida, a great peacemaker, was an outsider from the north to bring a message of peace. A great sky woman is said to have encouraged this message, and it symbolized the right of gaining consent of counsel of women or clan mothers before major political actions were taken. As an outsider, the great peacemaker's message was not influenced by any allegiance to any particular band. He spoke of peace from his heart rather than from personal interest. The message was to replace the blood feuds and the mourning wars with peace. The condolence ceremony would help achieve that. Being unaffected by grief, the great peacemaker was of sound mind and could perform said ceremony. Hiawatha's pain was alleviated, and now a disciple of the great peacemaker, Hiawatha began to travel the lands of the five nations to preach the good news of the condolence ceremony. So that he would not forget the ritual, he immortalized it with the beads made from shells known as wampum, which he wore around his neck. With these wampum, Hiawatha united the five nations of Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk, and later Tuscoria, into the six nations, the first democracy of North America and the stepping stone to modern democracy, something acknowledged in 1988 by the United States Congress. What a great opportunity to share some unknown faces and names. I hope you guys learned something new today. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more of our videos.